Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and The Amazing Spider-Man rebooted the Spider-Man franchise with a more edgy Peter Parker and a Gwen Stacy that they clearly can't wait to kill. No, yes. my parents see me leaving at dead. I'm gonna throw you out the window now. People will get hurt. Leave Gwen out of it. Wherever you fall on the spider spectrum, you probably have some mixed feelings about these two movies, but director Mark Webb did sneak in some fascinating details that I didn't catch before. Our subscribers requested that we revisit the past Spider-Man films, so let us explore everything that you might have missed in The Amazing Spider-Man of 2012, the changes it made to the franchise, and its hidden meaning. There is one. Okay, the opening flashback shows Peter Parker playing hide and seek with his father, Richard Parker. Mark Webb designed this as a metaphor for the film to follow. Peter's journey to find his father, but in the end, finding himself. What's your name? You don't know my name? No, I know your name. I just want to know if you know your name. And their teacher later codifies this theme. There were only ten different plots in all of fiction. There is only one. Who am I? Oh, movie teachers always working their lesson plans around exactly the theme the character needs to learn, instead of what we actually learn in high school, like French verb conjugation. Titties. Titties. That can't be the theme of a movie! Peter's father relationships is one of the many changes they made to the character's mythology. Instead of an orphan who never knows his parents, loses his uncle, and gains powers all seemingly by chance, this film hints at a greater conspiracy behind it all. Peter's father worked with Oscorp, the same animal genetics research division that led to his bite and to his antagonist's deformity. A deleted scene even suggested Peter was enhanced on purpose. Do you have any idea what you really are? In this opening scene, Peter's toy dinosaur is visible on the table, which I guess you could argue kind of foreshadows his coming battle with Richard's colleague, Kurt Connors, a lizard, whom New Yorkers later do describe as a dinosaur. Fine, there may not be a dinosaur running around Manhattan, but there is something more dangerous. Our first image of teenage Peter shows him pinning up the debate team photo where Gwen Stacy's visible there. And he takes a basketball to the head, humiliation that'll later pay back to Flash. After Tobey Maguire's classic nerd and Boy Scout take on the character, Andrew Garfield's Peter is an outsider by choice. He embraces his anonymity, and the identity of an internet troll is kind of what he seems to enjoy the most when he first becomes Spider-Man. The school ad man reprimands him. Keep it off the ground. Mm, Peter's skateboard is later broken. He does have a whole bunch of others to replace it though. But keep it off the ground is the advice he takes as he becomes Spider-Man. Uncle Ben is Martin Sheen in this movie. Aunt May is Sally Field, originator of one of my favorite running bits the whole time. And Peter, instead of beginning the movie as a four eyes, who sheds them when his vision improves as Spider-Man, this one begins with contacts and then puts on his father's glasses to look more like him. A costume that he will continue to wear as he follows in his dad's research until he sheds this layer and takes on a new skin. In Peter's bedroom are a poster for the Hitchcock film Rear Window, which is about a loner who spies on the world through a lens, much like Peter does, and a poster of Donald Glover from Community. Fans pushed for Donald Glover to be cast as Spider-Man in a reboot, and he did later make cameos in Homecoming and Into the Spider-Verse. Peter's search results show up a source from the Daily Bugle online. Later, there's a print version of the paper and a TV banner. And his Connors research includes an article titled Osborne, where is he? About the disappearance of Norman Osborne. Osborne's face remains in shadow in the Oscorp welcome screen. The plan was to have Chris Cooper play Norman in the third film. That never happened. Oscorp's Tree of Life display includes a rhino, a nod to the villain the rhino being introduced in the sequel, also hinting that his powers could have also stemmed from Oscorp. After the bite on his neck, Peter manspreads on the subway and envisions flashes of the Spider-Man logo on his skateboard. And then magically, the stunt guy who hits him with the skateboard switches from black to white. Oh, that was a Spider-Man power. And then one of the related search terms for Richard Parker is Richard Parker Life of Pi, a nod to the name given to the tiger in the Life of Pi novel and the 2012 film, in which Dr. Ratha actor in this movie, Irfan Khan, starred in. And in this movie, he later says the name Richard Parker. Richard Parker wore it well when he used a cheap suit. It's also worth noting that Tiger is Peter's comic nickname, so this is kind of like one tiger trying to be more like his daddy tiger. Peter begins to display agility and parkour, hanging out on the roof, catching falling mugs, and ruining basketball for everyone. Flash here wears the same number two as the guy on the subway, whom Peter also took a number two on. Peter spends the day swinging from chains to Coldplay and helping Dr. Connors become the lizard that he breaks his promise to Uncle Ben to pick up Aunt May. But your father lived by a philosophy, a principle really. 
He believed that, that if you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. Not choice, responsibility. Ah, the famous Uncle Ben quote paraphrased. Though to be fair, the original quote in the comics wasn't spoken by Uncle Ben. It was first written in the narration box. T-Bone the clerk is an asshole. But daddy didn't give you enough milk money today? T-Bone saw cutting the promo. Actually, T-Bone is the name of a low-level gangster Spider-Man and Blade saved from vampires in the comics. And he weirdly says daddy didn't give you enough milk money. Another twist of the knife of Peter's daddy issues. And a reminder that Peter apparently didn't give much a shit about his mom. Peter lets the mugger go. Hey kid, little help. Not my policy. Leading to Uncle Ben's death when Ben tries to stop this guy. They actually did shoot an alternate version that's less like the Raimi film, in which Ben is out looking for Peter, and he sees this mugger, thinks it's Peter, and follows him into the shadowy alley, which would have been pretty interesting to see Peter live with that guilt of Ben dying because he couldn't tell the difference between Peter and a criminal. I know this is a lot to process, so let's shift gears to something smaller, more digestible, more compact, like the most discreet front pocket wallet, The Ridge! Thanks to The Ridge for sponsoring this episode. The Ridge helps you carry what you need every day, from their flagship Ridge wallet to their portable charging commuter backpack, they want to make the most out of what you're bringing with you. The Ridge wallet is made out of military grade materials like titanium, carbon fiber, it has a clean, stylish look, it's chainsaw proof, so when all those tiki hating jerks come at you with chainsaws, their attacks will be not very effective. This is their aluminum tiki wallet. They do have other colors like matte cobalt blue or forged carbon fiber. All of them, they're light, they're strong, they're ready to party, but only with the minimal amount of cash that you brought with you because you don't need to bring everything. They make it easy to buy with free shipping and free returns and a lifetime guarantee. It's got 30,000 five-star reviews, so you know they're doing something right. They also have great backpacks and travel bags with RFID blocking pockets and optional device charging batteries. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash newrockstars. That's ridge.com slash newrockstars and use the code newrockstars. Find the link in the video's description. Peter hunts down the mugger wearing a Ramones shirt, maybe a nod to the Ramones covering the Spider-Man animated theme song and including it as a hidden track on their vinyls. And then Peter falls into a wrestling ring where he's inspired by this wrestling mask, a nod to his origin wrestling with Crusher Hogan in the comics. Peter orders Oscorp's webbing cable pellets, which he saw earlier on the assembly line. He engineers his own web shooters, another change from Raimi's organic wrist webbing. Though I'm not sure how Peter would be able to afford these. Maybe he shipped them to himself during his time in the lab with Connors, but he does complete his own custom-made suit. The building he's standing on here is New York's MetLife building, the real-life location that the MCU used for Avengers Tower. Avengers also came out this year in 2012, and it was supposed to feature this movie's Oscorp Tower in its skyline. Kevin Feige was an executive producer on both movies. Unfortunately, Columbia didn't get back to Marvel with the approval in time. But despite this suit, Peter is not yet the Spider-Man hero. It's evidenced by his bratty smack talk. I've got a mind of the true scholar, sir. It's my weakness. It's small knives. Oh, man. Don't, don't. <laughs> Dude, that isn't funny! Now, while this Deadpool-esque sass is definitely part of Peter's teenage identity and sense of humor, the problem is we haven't yet seen Peter be a true hero yet, hasn't saved any cats, so right now he's just kind of a dick, but that hero moment comes later in a really cool way. Peter arrives at Gwen's via her fire escape window, kind of a Peter and Wendy type arrival there, and on her shelf is the Seabiscuit novel. The movie Seabiscuit is what Tobey Maguire starred in between his first two Spider-Man movies, nearly caused him to have to sit out of the second one due to back injuries. The Stacey He's dying on Branzino, the fish that Flash and Spider-Man Homecoming later references. I know when Branzino's fresh, and that was not fresh, okay? And Peter reveals himself to Gwen as Spider-Man by whipping her in for a kiss. Kind of copying a move from Indiana Jones when he whipped Willie in for a smooch in Temple of Doom. On the Williamsburg Bridge, Dr. Ratha's driver is a cameo by Michael Papa John, the mugger and car thief in the Raimi films. And in what I think is the film's best moment, Peter saves the kid from the hanging, burning car by giving him his mask. Put it on! The mask! It's gonna make you strong. And Peter reunites his kid Jack, not with his mother, but with his father. In a sense, saving himself, the lost son, from his father. He gets a glimpse of this father-son reunion that he wants so deeply. And in this moment, Peter finally knows who he is. Who are you? John Cena! Oh, come on, this is an important moment. Who is he really? Spider-Man. That's who he is. He's not John Cena. Are you sure about that? And in thwipping this father and son back together, Peter also thwips a critical bond that will save his ass later when this same guy returns to favor as the crane operator who supplies Peter with his path to victory. Peter ruins another sport for everyone. 
and Peter fights the lizard in the sewer. One detail I really like about the lizard is that Connor's right hand has four fingers, while his left hand has five. That is because his left arm was just his normal human arm, with the five fingers turned into reptilian flesh, whereas his right arm fully regrew from the stump as a new monstrous reptile limb. Connors attacks Peter at his high school, emerging in the tattered lab coat, just like the lizard's appearance in the comics. Stan Lee cameos as a librarian, oblivious to everything, and Peter throws Gwen out the window and catches her, setting up why he assumes he'll be able to catch her this way in the second movie instead of, you know. When Peter follows Connors into the bathroom, notice how the camera lingers on that clawed fire blanket dispenser? That is because a deleted scene would have shown Peter finding Connors reverted to his human self in that blanket and taking pity on Connors. Instead, now Connors just like escapes back to the sewers, despite nearly accomplishing the whole point of him attacking the school to kill Peter. I know, it's just one of many of Reese Ivan's great scenes that were cut from this film, unfortunately. Connors' plan is to use a Ganali device mentioned earlier to turn everyone into reptiles via this green mist. It's the same color scheme as the vapor that created Green Goblin in the Raimi film. But after getting some help from New York's Crane Operators Union, Peter applies the anti-reptile move he brought up earlier. Because of the cold blood, would they react to sudden changes in temperature? Using liquid nitrogen to freeze the cold-blooded lizard as he and Captain Stacy take him down and dispensing the antidote to turn all those SWAT guys back into humans. And as Captain Stacy bleeds out, he gives Peter back his mask, just as Peter gave the kid back the mask to save him, make him feel strong, and he makes Peter promise to leave Gwen out of it. Of course, Peter doesn't. Connors is arrested and a post credit scene reveals him in prison with a man in the shadows, revealed in the next film, to be the gentleman who will set up the Sinister Six in the movie that never happened. Peter attends Gwen's dad's funeral from afar, but Flash went. Flash, Flash showed up. No matter, the cinematic universe, Flashes always pay their respects. Peter's final heroic swing through the city flings him past a pair of yellow pants that some fans say must belong to the Shocker, sure. But really, the cool detail comes right after he shoots himself out of that crane like a cannonball, and the camera matrix freezes with Spider-Man over the George Washington Bridge. Famously, the setting of the death of Gwen Stacy at the hands of Green Goblin in the comics, another reminder of the dark place this is all headed. And yeah, go for the turkey, let's show it. Boom, you looking for this? <laughs> or some of my deeper opinions on how this movie improves upon the Raimi trilogy, while also kind of ruining a generation of superhero movie fans into thinking anything cringe is evil. Join our official Discord server by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Our next watch along is coming up. You can join us for it there. Follow me on Instagram at EA Boss, follow new rockstars on socials, and subscribe to this channel. And let's pause to remember the moment Flash threatened a girl for just painting him a banner. You did that on purpose, Flash! No, but I should've. You better watch your back. The f